All right, folks, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this IPES Food Report Launch Webinar event. The event is called Who's Tipping the Scales? Rebalancing Power for Democratic Food System Governance. This will be a 60-minute virtual side event that's actually taking place during the fourth global conference of the One Planet Network's Sustainable Food System Program. We'd really like to thank the Sustainable Food System Program for inviting us to host this virtual side event during their conference that's taking place right now in Hanoi. My name is Nicole Pita, and I work in the Secretariat of IPES Food. We are the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. We're an interdisciplinary panel of just over 20 leaders in the world of food, from agronomists to sociologists social movement and civil society leaders from across the globe. Through our work, we seek to inform the debate about the transformation to sustainable food systems through policy-oriented research. And this webinar is about a new briefing note published today, Who's Tipping the Scales? Who's Tipping the Scales critically examines the power imbalances in decision-making about the food that we grow and eat. We find that big food and agriculture corporations have succeeded in convincing governments that they need to be central in any decisions about the future of food. At a time of unprecedented threats to planetary and human health and well-being, from the ongoing food price crisis to growing sovereign, a growing sovereign debt crisis and worsening climate and ecological breakdown, it's clear that food lies at the center of many of these challenges, but the change that we need at this point in our food systems must be transformational. In fact, this very conference, uh, the Sustainable Food System Program Conference, is called the transformation we need. But transformational solutions require acting against powerful vested, vested interests. So in our report, Who's Tipping the Scales?, we document the long history as well as the emerging and new mechanisms by which corporations have increased their influence over our food systems, and we propose transformational solutions to democratize food governance. Today, you will hear from two of our very esteemed panel members presenting the findings from our report. You'll hear from Molly Anderson, who's the Food Studies Chair at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont in the United States, where she teaches on hunger and food security, food system transformation, food policy, and sustainability. And you will also hear from Lim Li Ching, who is the current co-chair of IPES Food and a senior researcher at Third World Network, which is an international policy research and advocacy NGO based in Malaysia, focusing on sustainable development and the rights of peoples in the global south. First, we'll hear from Ching, who will outline the problems of corporate overreach in food system decision making. And then we'll switch to Molly, who will cover solutions to curb corporate overreach and democratize food governance. Just a couple more notes before I turn it over to Ching. First, the session is being recorded and will be posted online following this webinar event. And throughout the entire webinar, you have the opportunity to pose questions to the speakers. Please use the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom menu bar um, on your Zoom uh, screen. And at the very end, we have reserved time to answer those questions. So I'll be posing your questions to the speakers to answer live at that point. Um, the report is available online right now, and I'll post right now the link, there we go, in the chat, so you can check it out uh, after this event. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to point, I'm going to turn over now to Lim Li Ching to start this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, and a warm welcome to everyone. Um, it's good to see so many of you joining us virtually, uh, you know, um, perhaps even from Hanoi. Um, I see some uh, colleagues from Malaysia here, um, on, on this, uh, the webinar as well, so it's nice that we have a, a global audience. Um, I'm going to start by really identifying the problem, uh, because we know that we are living in times of multiple and compounding crises. We have a food price crisis, rising cost of living, rising hunger and malnutrition, climate breakdown, ecosystem destruction. And in fact, we're actually moving backwards on the sustainable development goals. And there is general agreement, as uh, Nicole has highlighted, that food system transformation is actually central to tackling these cha challenges. 
But how to go about doing this is actually hotly debated. We have see, heard widespread discussion and, and debate about how we can transform agricultural production practices, the need for technological innovations and shifting diets. However, power imbalances, which are rife in all areas of the food system, are often neglected, particularly power imbalances in food system governance. Now, what do we mean by food system governance? These are the institutions, policies, regulations, and norms that affect decision-making about our food systems. And today in this presentation, we will center on the following message. Central in the fight to tackle the global challenges of worsening hunger and malnutrition, climate chaos, and ecological destruction lies the fight for just and democratic food system governance. These have to go hand in hand. But for decades, the institutions, policies, and norms that affect decision-making about food systems have been unfortunately plagued by corporate overreach. Today, IPES Food is launching a briefing note as part of a series on global governance challenges. We have worked with our IPES Food colleagues to uncover the outsized power of transnational corporations in food system governance. The report, Who's Tipping the Scale?, raises alarm about the new ways in which decision-making processes on food are being captured by corporate interests. Our concern is that corporate influence over food system governance has become the new normal. It has become normalized with very little debate and inquiry among the public and states about this. But this has actually been the result of a long process of transition away from a public-centered governance process to a stakeholder-centered governance process or multi-stakeholder processes, whereby corporations, academia, international organizations and governments all have a seat at the table in food governance processes. And these often together with civil society and farmers organizations, but critically without acknowledging or addressing the power imbalances among these groups. And in fact, today, the agriculture and food sector is the sector with the most multi-stakeholder initiatives in the economy. Now, how did this happen and what are the consequences? Let's look a little bit at the historical context because the encroachment of transnational corporations in global food system governance is a historical development that has taken place over a long period of time. Let's rewind a moment. The 1970s were actually characterized by general skepticism about the role of transnational corporations. At that time, efforts were carried out to bring transnational corporations to account through regulation. In 1974, negotiations in the UN started to develop a UN code of conduct on transnational corporations, but this code of conduct never came to fruition. In fact, the Secretariat, uh, the UN, um, Center on Transnational Corporations was actually disbanded. Basically, uh, it was a battle of ideas between regulating corporations on the one side and protecting their rights as demanded by corporations on the other side, and the latter won. And this neoliberal climate that increasingly welcomed large businesses into governance fora replaced the previous skepticism. And it's a development that picked up place, pace in the 1980s when antitrust protections and enforcement were weakened and continued in the 1990s, when large agribusiness firms increasingly engaged in voluntary market-based governance initiatives and certification schemes, such as the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil or the Roundtable on Responsible Soy. Now, these were established to come up with sustainable certification schemes with basic labor and environmental conditions, albeit voluntarily. Critically, they've also normalized a prominent role for corporations and given them an inside track to decision-making. And through the 2000s, agri-food firms also increasingly began to shape governance and policy through multi-stakeholder efforts, such as engagement in public-private partnerships. As a number of governments pursued neoliberal economic strategies and cut back public funding, many firms upped their engagement in governance spaces as partners with the public sector. Public-private partnerships have flourished, um, such as the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, and the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. 
These are all public-private partnerships that are heavily active in policy making by advising governments on public policies around agriculture, nutrition, and other issues. And in recent years, multi-stakeholder initiatives have become a key mechanism in global food governance, with the growing adoption and formalization of new forms of multi-stakeholder initiatives, including in UN settings. And furthermore, due to the crisis in public funding nationally and internationally, many UN institutions are now forced to seek funding from private sectors. Corporate partnerships provide key sources of funding for global food governance institutions, while at the same time providing corporations with an inside track on decision making. The Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, or CGIAR, stands out as an example. It has increasingly relied on funding from private firms and private philanthropic foundations with close ties to industry. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was the second largest donor to the CG system in 2020, and nearly $100 million, dwarfing the amounts pledged by individual governments, including the United States. And regrettably, the FAO has also pursued close collaboration with the corporate sector through industry partnerships, although many of the details, including concerning funding contributions, are unfortunately not readily available. And its recent partnership with CropLife, a major pesticide lobby organization that has many large agribusiness firms as members, is one of the more recent examples of this type of, of arrangement. And these kinds of partnerships between private sector actors and international governance bodies regrettably create conflicts of interest and do need to be subject to checks and balances. Now, for many food system actors, the 2021 UN Food System Summit was a watershed moment in drawing attention to corporate influence over public food governance through multi-stakeholder processes. The Food System Summit was of course vital in that it drew very welcome attention to the need to take a holistic food system approach to tackle many of the world's most wicked global challenges, and thus the urgent need for food system transformation. However, the summit was also a product of a 2019 strategic partnership between the UN and the World Economic Forum, an organization that lobbies for and represents the 1,000 biggest corporations on the planet. As such, a powerful alliance of transnational corporations, big philanthropies, and export-oriented countries played a big hand in organizing the, food, the summit. And despite its own commitments to transparency, accountability, and human rights, the development of the summit was regrettably not transparent enough, and its governance poorly defined and open to conflicts of interest. Initial planning and agenda setting for the summit bypassed established fora and mechanisms for civil society and farmer engagement, particularly through the Committee on World Food Security or CFS. Later, of course, the CFS was engaged after concerns were raised, and some of these concerns were addressed through new action tracks. But in our opinion, it was too little, too late. Now, concerns were raised clearly and consistently by farmers' organizations, social movements, civil society, indigenous peoples, and independent scientists. But this, unfortunately, were not sufficiently addressed. And as a result, many of these groups were deeply troubled by what they considered to be the corporate capture of global food governance that could undermine the public good, as well as the rights of peoples and communities to engage with food systems decision making. Many boycotted the summit and fundamentally questioned the premise that transnational corporations should set the agenda, propose the solutions, and have a seat at the decision-making table for the future of food systems. Indeed, corporations have become increasingly vocal in staking their claim to be it and to shape food governance processes and spaces, often arguing that they have a necessary and key role to play in food system transformation. And while they do have a key role to play, this is very different from handing the reins over to them. This slide summarizes the visible mechanisms by which large corporations influence global food governance, which I've already outlined. But there are also less visible approaches that impact the broader context within which food system decision-making takes place. Though these strategies may be less visible and less direct, they still have extensive impacts on global and national food systems by shaping markets, material conditions in food systems and policy making, all of which matter for food system governance. 
I think the first one um, is the growing corporate concentration of the agri-food sector. This is something that is quite familiar, I think, to many of us uh, and has been an increasing concern um, and it follows from the weakening of antitrust protections in the 1980s and the rise of neoliberalism, which encouraged consolidation across the food system, reinforcing the power of large corporations. In fact, many of today's largest agri-food corporations like Bayer, Monsanto, John Deere, BASF, Dow DuPont, they consolidated power in the early, early 20th century. But what we've seen is an acceleration of mergers and acquisitions over the past few decades that has served to further consolidate that power. And in most segments of the agri-food system today, just a few corporate players dominate markets from the agricultural input industry to global food trade to food retail. For example, the top six firms control 78% of the global, global agrochemicals markets and only four firms control 70 to 90% of global grain trade. Now this significant market share in the hands of a few firms gives them market power, which enables them to shape the contours of markets for the products they sell, for example, by creating barriers that prevent other firms from competing with them. And such measures include high levels of spending on research and development that's hard for new market entrants to match, as well as sponsorship of academic research that is sympathetic to corporate interests, which can ultimately influence policy making. The market power of large agribusiness firms is deeply entwined with their ability to exercise another form of power, that is political power. Dominant firms can spend large amounts of money to directly lobby government policymakers and regulators at the national and international levels in a bid to influence policies and regulations that affect their bottom lines, including regulations on biosafety, pesticide, trade, and investment agreements. And some of the worst offenders are in the US, where spending on corporate lobbying has doubled in the last two decades, from $80 million in the year 2000 to $150 million in 2021. And agri-food firms can also influence policy through the phenomenon of the revolving door, whereby former industry employees often move to policymaking and regulatory roles and then return to industry positions often once the government's positions end. So we need to be aware of both the visible and the invisible influences of corporations on global food governance. And through these various mechanisms, corporate involvement in the global governance of food and agriculture has really effectively been normalized and rarely seen as a problem, particularly by powerful governments inviting industry players into governance spaces. So at ICAS Food, we hope to raise alarm about this trend, and therefore we deem this is a problem of corporate captured food system governance. We cannot find the answers to long-term structural solutions to the multiple crises the world is facing under such conditions of unregulated power and control by dominant food system players without effective action to address the new normal of corporate captured governance food systems will increasingly be shaped by private interests when it is clear that it should be public interest that should be a center stage so why is this problematic in our report we set out three main types of problems associated with the growing presence of large agri food firms in global food governance these are related to number one, governance processes, number two, governance outcomes, and three, questions of accountability. Now with respect to processes, the growing capture of food governance initiatives has been facilitated by the rising dominance of the stakeholder paradigm. Grounded in a largely undifferentiated categorization of actors or stakeholders with an interest or concern in the matter, now, multi-stakeholder initiatives sound like a good thing, but what they do is they actually blur the lines between the roles and responsibilities of rights holders, such as indigenous peoples or farmers, women, and duty bearers, meaning states as the upholders of these rights, and those acting on behalf of corporate agendas. And this blurring occurs in large part because the structures and norms that underpin such processes are often opaque and neither emerge from nor are subject to democratic scrutiny. What's ironic is that multi-stakeholder initiatives often claim transparency as part of their public face, 
Even when agendas get set behind the scenes, the corporations tend to dominate effectively excluding genuine civil society and grassroots social movement participation. This is a result of the power imbalances we mentioned at the start. And when it comes to outcomes, corporate influence affects the quality and effectiveness of governance initiatives. In fact, it's incredibly difficult to find evidence demonstrating the outcomes of multi-stakeholder initiatives and whether they have actually achieved their goals. Further, the type of governance initiatives that emerge through corporate dominated processes, such as industry led certification schemes, and are often weak and ineffective in tackling the root cause of the problems they seek to address, and they certainly do not address power imbalances. The set of possible solutions that get discussed are extremely narrow and favor corporate interests. For instance, the industry routinely lobbies against mandatory public health measures such as taxes on ultra-processed foods and sugary drinks and restrictions on the marketing of unhealthy food to children, and instead pushing for ineffective voluntary approaches. And finally, concerning accountability, corporate dominated governance efforts, such as multi-stakeholder initiatives, typically avoid rules that hold firms to account, both legally and financially, when their practices cause harm to people and nature, and this enables corporate impunity for operations and practices and a lack of effective remedy, a lack of access to justice for those who have been harmed, even in cases of critical violations and abuses of human rights, such as undermining the right to food, abusive labor practices, and widespread environmental pollution. Multi-stakeholder initiatives are unfortunately rife with conflicts of interest, but also undermine accountability. And this is because corporations focus on profits and the maximization of shareholder value, but they are in a conflict of, of interest when they engage in setting public governance rules meant to protect the public good, but which also affect their own operations. Well, this is not a new problem. So what has been done and what is being done to rein in the power of corporations in food systems governance? In our opinion, not enough. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Molly Anderson, to uh, complete the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ching. And I get the more optimistic part of the report here, where we get to talk about some solutions, potential solutions that have been tried, but also solutions and recommendations that we have in mind that might go a little bit farther. In our report, we examine various initiatives that have been implemented over the years and find that while efforts have increased over the past decades to keep corporations more accountable, and they're very important, they're not sufficient and some are sorely inadequate. Most approaches operate within prevailing structures and do not fundamentally question the role of corporations, nor do they specifically prioritize the public interest they also often place undue emphasis on the flawed concept of due diligence, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. For example, in 2011, the UN Human Rights Council adopted the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, a set of voluntary guidelines for states and companies imposing human rights and environmental due diligence obligations on companies but some of the problems with using due diligence as a primary mechanism for accountability are covered in the report. Suffice it to say that as long as due diligence liability is defined by a list of preventative measures that corporations can take and not on actual harm that they cause to individuals, communities, or the environment, then corporations can successfully evade liability they can say that they're taking these preventative measures and block affected communities and individuals from accessing justice, even if their rights have been violated. What's more, these principles and other international initiatives are simply voluntary recommendations and guidance for, quote, responsible business conduct, end quote, not legally binding requirements. That's something that needs to change. When they are mandatory, they lack any teeth for enforcement, especially because corporations themselves are expected to develop their own internal procedures to identify and account for their impacts 
on human and environmental rights in global supply chains. In addition to measures at the international level, many national governments have policies and regulations in place that aim to curb corporate influence, but they're neither coordinated nor systematic across countries. Some of these measures include competition or antitrust policies that seek to limit corporate power by ensuring that mergers and acquisitions don't lead to anti-competitive market practices, but these are almost exclusively focused narrowly on consumer prices and efficiency, such that mergers are rarely prohibited if they're expected to bring sufficient, quote, efficiency gains, in quote, that lower consumer prices. And often this isn't checked after the merger or acquisition to see if these uh, lowered consumer prices actually happened. Other national measures that exist in some countries include rules and regulations that require firms to report their lobbying activities. And while there are limits on campaign spendings in most countries, there are often no limits on the amount that lobbyists can spend more generally. Unfortunately, many comprehensive measures are still missing. Almost non-existent are other measures to rein in excessive market power measures to rein in public funding by corporations and measures to address underfunding of public institutions, which has become a very serious problem under neoliberal governance. In our report, we also look at ongoing negotiations for a binding UN treaty on transnational corporations and human rights. This is in the works. It's been in the works for a while. It would be a comprehensive framework and a legally binding instrument imposed on corporations via international and national law to hold them accountable for human rights abuses, one that also includes monitoring and enforcement mechanisms. This is a very promising initiative and has opened up a political space for broad mobilization of civil society, social movements and NGOs, but negotiations have been ongoing for nearly a decade now and would only cover the worst corporate abuses. The treaty must move forward and be implemented, but it's still not enough. So what more is needed? Uh, this is what we cover in the report. To build resilient, sustainable and equitable food systems, we need to fundamentally level the playing field in food system decision-making between the public and the private. In our report, we outline three overarching principles for action, which are shown here on the left, and three accompanying concrete recommendations. First, we need to address the outsized influence of transnational agri-food corporations at all levels of food systems, the things that Ching were, were pointing out and that are described in more detail in our report. Second, we need to democratize food governance to serve the public interest, including holding corporations accountable for human rights violations and environmental destruction. And third, we need to build up autonomous processes and spaces that center the voices, claims, and proposals of people's organizations and social movements. We realize that this is really essential as we work through the report. Um, civil society needs to have a space of its own in order to develop its own proposals without interference. So let's move to the first recommendation that we're making. We can start by addressing the influence of corporations in food governance. And some of the things that can be done here are creating mechanisms to manage conflicts of interest. We have some great examples of that from the World Health Organization, but we need to implement these in other places like the Committee on World Food Security. We need to create measures to reduce corporate market power. We need to develop stricter rules on lobbying, spending and campaign financing as well as transparency in reporting. 
We need to counter the shaping of science and public discourse by large corporations. Um, the, the kinds of ways in which corporations are buying scientists or uh, posting articles that are basically written by corporations, but are uh, posted as being written by independent scientists. We need to redirect government resources to public interest, redirect resources like subsidies from serving private interest to serving public interest. One concrete proposal that we've put forward is to develop a UN-wide corporate accountability framework, building upon the discussions around the legally binding instrument, which continues to be negotiated in the UN Human Rights Council. This framework would serve to keep the UN free of undue corporate interference and hold corporations accountable for the impacts of their activities. There are already some initiatives within UN body, bodies to do this, but nothing that's yet been instituted across the whole UN system. A UN-wide corporate accountability framework would include holding industry liable for harm caused to people and communities. One specific mechanism to ensure this would include mandating a duty of care in contrast to due diligence which imposes legal obligations on corporations for responsible care towards individuals in the environment, for ensuring that any harm that can be foreseen that's preventable is actually being prevented. Inspiration can be found in processes within the World Health Organization, including the, the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and the WHO Framework of engagement with non-state actors. So let's move on to our second recommendation. This is the push to democratize governance to serve the public interest. States and civil societies need to ensure that governance at all stages is serving the public interest at all level, levels from the local up to the international. This would mean developing inclusive participation mechanisms grounded in human rights, again, at all levels. These should prioritize the authentic participation of people's organizations, social movements, and other civil society actors, particularly for those who are most affected by the, the issues addressed in the space, those whose human rights are being violated. This would mean kicking out individuals and in, in entities with corporate or industry specific commercial interest from engaging as decision makers. Just as we shouldn't be inviting tobacco companies to participate in tobacco control policy making processes, we shouldn't be inviting agri food giants or their representatives to participate in food system regulation and decision making because of obvious conflicts of interest and because of the fact that often it's their actions that are causing the human rights violations. This also is going to require a, a caveat. We need to differentiate between the corporate sector and other private sector actors, such as small scale food producers, local cooperatives, associations, et cetera, which are not creating these, these massive human rights violations in most cases. One concrete proposal that we put forward is that this push to democratize the governance of food systems should begin with the Committee on World Food Security via civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism, which is already in place and has been very active. It was actually remarkable that initial planning for the food system summit completely sidestepped the Committee on World Food Security, in effect, undermining it. Instead, the CFS urgently needs to be bolstered and strengthened in many ways so that it becomes a space where regional and global problems that threaten global food systems for producers and consumers are examined and addressed. For instance, the high-level panel of experts of the Committee on World Food Security is an excellent venue for examining these different issues. It has already published 
a multitude of great reports and policy recommendations are developed based on these reports by the Committee on World Food Security. They aren't always perfect by any means, but this is a, a venue that's already in place that has excellent procedures for bringing in new members, for balance, for vetting reports across a wide range of different actors, and it needs to be strengthened and its mandate needs to be extended. Let's move to our third recommendation. We recommend moving beyond damage control to build up autonomous processes and spaces, particularly those that are centering the voices and agenda of women, indigenous peoples, and frontline communities, which are being marginalized now in policy, justice, and governance structures. So this involves creating autonomous processes and spaces for the claims and proposals of people's organizations and social movements to be made and heard on the, uh, their own terms. One example of this is the Nyel and E process, which has met several times to develop proposals for food sovereignty, uh, to develop a clearer understanding of agroecology, there's another Nyelani uh, meeting that's due to take place in 2025. And this is a place where civil society is meeting um, and agendas and decision-making are being set by civil society. Of course, they need to be negotiated with other actors, to be negotiated by people from governments, by delegates, but these autonomous spaces need to be resourced adequately so that they can continue to meet and continue to meet in such a way that strategies and actions are determined by people's organizations and social movements. This requires establishing structures that enable regular dialogue, exchange and joint governance initiatives between state, multilateral, civil society, and social movement organizations. Every state should be meeting regularly with representatives from civil society to get this kind of feedback on its initiative. In our report, we provide many examples comparable to the Nyelany process of longstanding and emerging democratic governance spaces that allow people to engage in food system decision-making. The International Movement for Food Sovereignty is another example, as well as food policy councils at the local and sometimes state level, participatory budgeting initiatives, and citizen juries. These are all ways that citizens can participate much more actively in food governance. In conclusion, an urgent change in the global governance of food systems is needed with livelihoods, biodiversity, food security, and nutrition hanging in the balance. These are the things that we mean by public interest. We must start by problematizing the narrative that agri-food corporations must have a seat at the table when determining the future of food. The challenges that global food systems are facing are not ones of inadequate markets or production systems, their problems of power and market failures. To transform food systems into ones that revitalize local communities, maintain livelihoods for small-scale farmers, ensure resilience, and maintain biodiversity, it's necessary to rein in corporate influence, both behind the scenes and more officially in food governance spaces to democratize decision-making and to build new ways of governing in the public interest. So thank you. Uh, we'll post the link again to where you can find the report in case you came in a little bit later. And now we have some time to take questions from the audience. I know that Nicole and Robbie Blake, our communications officer, have been gathering your questions from the Q&A and from the chat and Ching and I would be glad to feel them and try to answer them to the best of our ability. 
Thanks, Molly. And let me just start up my video again. All right, thanks. Thank you, Molly and Ching, for those presentations. We have plenty of time for your questions, so keep popping those in the Q&A box. I do want to elevate one that I think could be a question to everybody who is online right now, not just our speakers. Um, but there, there was a question, do you know of any live campaigns or actions taking place that, um, that people can get involved with to support and help on this issue? So I've seen some activity in the chat uh, about current podcasts or other reports that have come out. Please, folks, continue to share those resources. And if there are any campaigns that you're looking for more um, involvement in, do also link to them in the chat. I don't know if Molly uh, or Ching, you want to add anything to this. I can one that immediately. Thank you for the the, the uh, question. And one that immediately springs to mind is uh, he, uh, spearheaded by Pesticide Action International and other groups, including uh, Fian, Third World Network, and others. Uh, which is called Stop the Toxic Alliance, um, because um, this was spurred, campaign was spurred by the uh, partnership between FAO and Crop Life um, International. And Crop Life, of course, uh, represents the biggest um, pesticides companies. And they felt, and we as civil society felt that this was inappropriate and uh, would be rife with conflicts of interest. Um, so this is something that's currently ongoing. It's also something that I think. Uh, resonates with people because they can see that um, you know involving very closely uh, the pesticides uh, industry uh, with a food governance body, a food and agriculture body like the FAO uh, is actually inappropriate. And the spe UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food uh, also recently called for this to agreement uh, between the two entities to be rescinded. And a Corporate Accountability is also an organization that's done really great work in spearheading successful campaigns, ranging from the original campaign against Nestle about um, uh, breast milk substitutes to other things. So they would be a place that I would be looking for the most current campaigns. But I'm seeing wonderful comments here in the chat. And it looks like other people have suggestions for campaigns. Thank you. Thank you for posing that question. And, uh, and folks, everyone, are, uh, for answering. The next question we have from Bran Fran Bernhardt from Sustain. Uh, very interesting, the attempts to rein in corporate power that have been uh, listed. In, from a report, but it would be great to hear some insights into how to embed those standards and recommendations into current government systems. So I think more at the national level is what this question is getting at. Um, is there is there anything that we can speak to about that rather than more international uh, guidelines? That's a great question. And of course, this can't be only at the international level. They have to be upheld at the state level in order to be effective. And this requires having people in your legislatures who are responsive to these concerns. And it requires steady political pressure on these people to hold them accountable, to hold elected officials accountable for what they promise to do. Yeah, and, uh, and perhaps I'll just also add, I think this is uh, particularly um, an issue, um, not just in developed countries, but also for many developing countries, uh, where the outsized influence of corporations, uh, you know, could affect um, um, how things play out at the national level. And of course, uh, the issue of regulation is incredibly important, uh, national level laws, for example, and this is why the international level work is also uh, provides the, the kind of framework and understanding and, and narrative that's important. The other thing I also wanted to point out, and this really is, 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 is kind of points to the invisible effect, is that many of the free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties uh, that are being signed by governments today uh, include uh, clauses for investor state dispute settlement giving investors or corporations the right to sue governments directly for any um, measures by which they think that their profits are affected. 
So this could even be, for example, um, for taking uh, environmental measures. Many of the um, ISDS cases are around when governments took measures to protect the environment, for example, or to protect communities that were affected uh, by the actions of corporations. And yet they found themselves sued uh, by these corporations because of these unjust clauses. So I think that it's important to address um, corporate uh, overreach, both at the national level and the international level, and they have to go hand in hand. Thank you. And if I could just add, millions of dollars have been transferred to corporations through these investor state dispute uh, settlements. So this is ongoing. It's really, really a scandal. Uh, yet it's it's legal. That's actually written into too many trade agreements. The Committee on World Food Security has excellent guidelines that have been that have been established for many things like uh, tenure and the right to food, of course. But these guidelines mean very little if they aren't being taken down to the state level, and people are pushing for them to be enacted. Governments can agree to them at the international level through peer pressure because they think, well, this is this is OK. I'm not going to be held to this in my own country. Yet um, civil society actors need to be aware of what's being agreed in the Committee on World Food Security and actually push their governments to enact these at the, the local and state level. Great, I'm gonna move on. We're getting lots of questions. So uh, it's gonna be, yeah, rapid fire. Uh, so the next one, Mateo Zanella from the Global Alliance for the Future of Food asks um, that the example that we gave about this um, not food related, the tobacco um, or World Health Organization uh, uh, guidelines, they're still generally unknown in the food system community. So can you can you elaborate a bit more about what what that process was like to put in corporate controls and um, on the tobacco industry itself and how that could be translated into the food movement and food governance? I don't work for who, so I I can't give you a lot of detail here, but I did work with a group of people who were trying to improve the governance, the transparency of the UN Food System Summit. And there were people from the World Health Organization there who were saying that this is, this is a really good framework that would be a good starting place. Um, I think Lena is on the call and she may have additional information on that. I saw her posting something on chat not too long ago. Maybe I, I can just jump in very quickly uh, because I think a, a lot of um, people who have looked at the issue of conflict of interest point to the uh, framework convention on tobacco control, which very clearly excludes uh, the tobacco companies from participating in the decision-making processes uh, and in the treaty-making process. Um, so this is not the case in other uh, multilateral fora um, that I'm familiar with. Uh, but I think the, the real example here is that when you have an industry that is supposed to be regulated, then they cannot participate uh, in decisions around them. Um, and I think this is very clearly said in the, um, the, 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 the convention. And as Molly had mentioned in her presentation, it, the same truth should apply. Uh, when it comes to uh, making regulations uh, on food and agriculture, that big agribusiness uh, should not be drafting the rules or you know, participating in the negotiations. Thank you. Great. I'm going to piggyback off something Molly said because there's a question about the UN Food System Summit. Uh, there will be a stock taking moment in July, uh, so two years after the UN Food System Summit from 2021. Uh, is this just going to be take two of the UN Food System Summit? Julie Sage asks, uh, what should we be looking out for? What do we know so far? It, actually, we know very little. And, and this is very much in line. It's very much congruent with the original Food System Summit that the agenda was not posted early on, the people behind the agenda 
were not posted. So we really don't know all that much other than that national governments will be presenting what they had said they would be doing. And there will be presentations from the various coalitions that were formulated uh, during the UN Food Systems Summit about what they're doing now. Some of these coalitions are very good. They've gone off in a, a relatively independent direction. And some of them are still very heavily uh, influenced by corporates. And Ching, do you have any more information about that? I've been trying to get information and just have not been able to get it. And, and this happened with the Food System Summit too. I was always trying to look behind the scenes. Well, who's going to be there and who's presenting and who actually created this agenda and where's the funding coming from? And those questions simply could not be answered. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, more information on that. I do know that social movements and civil society are starting to discuss it because obviously it's going to be an important moment. Uh, and um, as, as mentioned in, in the presentation, many of these groups actually boycotted uh, the original Food System Summit because of the concerns. Um, so we'll, we'll see how things play out. Okay, I think we might be able to hear from Lena. Oh no, maybe not. And and L Lena, forgive me for pointing to you. I just know that you had some really good comments when we were working on governance of the, the Food System Summit. Oh, I see you ah. do have your hand up. Let's see. Yes, I hope this can work. Lena, can you hear us and can you, can you give us a shout? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for, for this, the discussion. It's really useful. And yeah, I tweeted also that it, I think it's courageous also for the One Planet Network to, to have this side event uh, during the, the fourth uh, global conference in, in Hanoi, because we do need to speak about the elephants in the room and power imbalance is one of them. But um, just um, as a matter of, of transparency and clarity, I had been seconded by WHO to the Food Systems Coordination Hub for a year. Uh, that segment has ended, but I've put in the chat uh, information on the stock taking moment um, where uh, there has been a call for expression of interest for being there in person uh, or participating virtually. Also a call to uh, organize a side event for, as Molly said, especially coalitions. And I, I, I really... I'm I'm I was also heavily involved in the food system summit from a WHO perspective. And to be honest, I, I sometimes felt very lonely there with my voice as WHO is one of the UN agencies with the strictest measures on, on, on private sector engagement. And I mean, it, it's a it's a choice whether you want to be at the sidelines and see a big train passing by and shouting like, we don't agree with you, or being on that train and trying to be there with enough people to kind of influence the direction it is going. And I'm in, in the latter one. So I did feel lonely uh, being there with some very courageous, small uh, civil society organizations that joined in the process. So I hope that now for the stock taking moment, um, there would, your voice need to be heard in those areas where you think there is too much corporate influence. So I would strongly advocate to engage, and those that are in, in Hanoi, to engage with um, uh, colleagues from the hub uh, that are there um, speaking, to talk with them, see what can be done, and, and, and understand uh, that it, it shouldn't be the enemy. I mean, we all want food systems transformation, but just how and what it means, we need to get our voice heard about that. So yeah, that's maybe, but consult consult um, the, the, the hub's website um, because they really post, as soon as there is more information, they post it um, uh, on their website, all the information. Over Thank you. you. Thank you, Lena. Thanks for your quick intervention there. Um, before we run out of time, there's a really interesting question here raised by Julia Berenger, who says, regarding steps to democratize food governance, 
what do you do when corporations are co-opting the language and talking about democracy themselves and participation and inclusion? What then? That has been a real problem. They've co-opted all, all sorts of things uh, from sustainability. Uh, sustainability is all over corporation websites now, and they promise that, that they have the pathway to sustainability. Um, there are real fears that corporations are trying to co-opt agroecology, and someone posted a message about the Agroecology Coalition, which is really fighting to maintain a transformative vision of agroecology, along with many people within civil society. Um, it, it's a problem, and we can't just keep shifting to new terms. Um, we had a report in IPAS Food about narratives, some of the narratives like regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions, we see as being relatively empty compared to agroecology. And you can go onto our website and find that report. Um, we did it in cooperation with the Institute for Development Studies at University of Sussex. And it talks about this process of co-optation and how you can try to, to hang on to terms that were originated by civil society, but have suddenly been picked up by um, corporations. And this, this veneer of inclusivity I found that to be one of the more offensive things about the UN Food Systems Summit, that they were bringing in indigenous people, women, youth. Uh, I, th I thought they were instrumentalizing youth, um, taking advantage of them. Yet these are groups that really need to be part of the process. And it's important to respect the ways that they have already organized themselves through groups like the Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism. Just, just to also add, I, I think it's it's probably, um, you know, this is going to be a constant problem uh, where, you know, the terms get co-opted, misused, uh, we see that rife all over. And I think for, for me, it's also a question of looking, uh, you know, unmasking uh, the actors behind, uh, but, but also holding it up to, I, I mean, some sort of principles or criteria, because like if we talk about agroecology, for example, and we want it to be transformative, it's got to be, you know, very much farmer centered, it's got to be about social justice, uh, not just production practices. So they're, they're, they're these, I guess, um, you know, principles by which each term could be put up against and say, does it address this? Is it, if you want to talk about participation, is it about, you know, kind of like, sometimes you get this where it's about uh, fostering acceptance, for example, of certain, you know, technologies or certain interventions, or is it really genuinely uh, about uh, giving voice to those who have rights, the rights holders? Um, it's, it's a difficult one. And I think, it, you know, we have to just be constantly alert uh, to these sorts of issues. For instance, with agroecology, FAO has 10 principles, and in the report that was done by the high-level panel of experts, there's 13 elements, and you need to check to see if when a corporation is talking about agroecology, are they truly adhering to these elements and principles? That's the test. Great. Thank you. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions, so we're going to wrap it up here. Big thanks again to Molly Anderson, Lim Lee Ching, and all of the panel members that worked on this report. Who's Tipping the Scales? It's available online at the IPES Food website and in the link in the chat. Please check it out after you finish up with this call. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day. Thank you so much.